This is it! The greatest team in the history of League of Legends taken down by the greatest team Europe has ever produced! G2 is heading to Paris! Revenge is still what drives Faker and T1 versus their nemesis, G2 Esports. And G2 will remain undefeated in this tournament and T1 take their first match loss this year. In their first matchup, the LCK champions were quickly brought down to earth by the team that's sailing up as the new favorites to lift the MSI title. Decent knockback there on Zayas, but he's going down low. Double kill for Yankos already in the team fight. G2 once again wipe the floor with T1 in the 5v5. Caps is currently 9 and 3 against Faker. 9 and 3 against the greatest player that has ever entered the rift. This is an incredible record for the best in the West. But for Faker, this humiliation cannot stand. Froggy dashing and he misses on the second second. Oh, BJ's still stepping forward. He wants to keep him interested. That's one shot down, but Faker's here. Oh no, they've overstayed. They have bit off more than they can chew, and it's a double for Faker himself. Although Europe may be high on their recent victories, we may be poking the slumbering beast that is the LCK. In this featured matchup presented by Mercedes-Benz, we'll see the best player in the world today against the greatest player of all time. This is a matchup you won't want to miss. I absolutely love that video. And these two teams have faced off so many times in recent history. And it is, of course, a very close rivalry with G2 being somewhat of T1's nemesis. I mentioned at the top of the show, Caps right now has a winning record against Faker. But frankly speaking, both of these teams need to work on a lot of problems. I want to take a very quick look at the standings in just a moment because of the expectations with both teams losing. And while that comes up, also I'm going to come to you and talk. Let's start with T1. This is a team we're still expecting to see more changes and it's just not coming quickly enough. Yeah, I feel like their style of play isn't working. It's not matching up to the meta we've seen leaning more into team fights. And although they still find early leads consistently, it gets to the point where they start to make mistakes around Baron and their compositions really don't help them. And yeah, I was going to say, it's not even that they like can't team fight, right? Like they still have, in my opinion, the best control around like early game timers. They still team fight well together, but with the comps that they're picking, it doesn't have the same 5v5 punch that a lot of their opponents have picked, especially in the game we just saw against DG. I really want to see as well how T1 approach these last three games because just as an interesting tidbit, this is the first MSI or World Championship that T1 has ever played on home soil. I spoke a little bit about the players in the interviews saying some of the stress and the pressure they're feeling in that defeat earlier today. The players looked distraught on stage. But now a similar story, Emily, can be said for G2 because frankly, their draft today, I didn't mind. I hated the way they tried to play it, however, and that's three games in a row that they've kind of been outmatched on the Rift. So for talking about draft, just generally as analysts, you look at two things. Like, is this draft like really cohesive and good into their opponent? And then also, is this draft good for these players? Because like to point out a pick I didn't necessarily like in terms of objectively was Jinx, but is that good for Danny on EG? Yes. Yeah. So we're looking at these G2 compositions and I don't have like a massive issue with them. But when I'm thinking about what G2 were good at and what got them here. I want to see Flacket on a hyper carry. I think his team fighting is really, really good. Um, I want to see Targamus on something where he has a lot of engage, where he can roam. Um, I definitely still want to see like Caps, Yonkos, mid jungle duo, and then Broken Blade on something that maybe is a little bit more tanky and a frontliner so they can play more front to back or more dive. Orgs, I do need to jump in. We don't have a huge amount of time. So who is going to win this game, in your opinion? What will be the deciding factor? Oh, I think... I think G2, I think T1 still are taking too long to adapt. And although G2 have regressed a bit, they started the Rumble stage off knowing what they had to do in the meta. Oh, higher expectations based on early game form or early tournament form. Emily, G2 or T1? Uh, I guess I'll take the other side. All right. Like, okay, I'll, so that's the, not like, the most convincing. Yeah. No, How will no, T1 like, do that? So, okay. so here's the thing. I still think I do like T1's early game a lot. And if they just draft a composition that has like a better scaling 5v5, I still think their mid-game execution isn't, you know, 
awful enough that they still could come out ahead, right, with a few draft tweaks. I think, like, this is a prediction that I'd be like, I really want to see the draft. It's not poopy yeah. enough execution to completely throw them <laughs> under the bus. So we got 1G2, 1T1. It's time for our MasterCard fan predictions for this matchup, T2 versus T1. You can vote every day on Twitter at MasterCard Nexus. And everybody at home, the percentages are... 56% in favor of G2, 44% in favor of T1. That's almost as strong a vote as Emily just gave me on <laughs> the other stairs. Are you calling We've me got out for my fresh... weak-ass predictions? Yes, I am. That is exactly Fair. what I'm doing. We've got some fresh faces ready to kick off the cast. So heading over to you, Dagda and Medic for the cast. Blah, blah, blah. Thank you very much, Quick Shot. Very kind of you guys to hand it over to us. We are here for the final three games of the day. The final three games of the penultimate day of MSI. Oh, Things are getting very spicy today as well, Doug. I know, especially when I came into today, I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to have a fairly good idea as to what way this is all going to pan out. And now I have no clue. We're sitting with a three-way tie in second place. We got T1 versus G2 to try and, you know, break that stride. But, I mean, even with Saigon Buffalo, they can nearly taking down RNG. Like, what the hell's going on? Man? It's just been a mess of a day. And obviously, like, we'll talk about stakes and we'll talk about the table and we'll talk about how we've got three teams tied at four and three and PSG just behind them and RNG probably making it in that first spot. But what I really want to focus down on is just the gameplay in this game because both these teams came into MSI in dominant fashion. They both destroyed their regions. They both went undefeated in the group stage and G2 kind of started Rumble slightly better than T1, but both of them now seem to be on a slump. Yeah, and it kind of feels like, at least from T1 side of things, like you could hear there was an interview with Ashley Kang yesterday with Faker where he was talking about, you know, how they have really taken a knock on the confidence. They're not really sure how they want to play. They're not trying to like fix like little minute things. They're more looking at a holistic change, but we haven't really seen that from T1 coming into today. And for G2 as well, just not able to get the better of PSG talent, you feel like this team, well, both teams, honestly, really want to try and take that step up so they can get back onto their winning form. And a big step up it would be for both these teams. Last time they met, G2 took the game. They are 1-0 in the head-to-head -head right now. The uh, score lines at MSI tied though at four and three. Let's have a look at what we see in the draft phase. Lucian has been so commonly a red side ban. Expect T1 to ban it out here. Caitlyn, obviously, respect to Gumiyushi. Yeah, I mean, it's been something that's banned a lot against T1. 68% of the games that Caitlyn gets taken off the board. Lucian, as well, has done red side ban. Probably expect the Wukong to come in on that side as well, just against G2. And Gwen being taken away from Zayas in that top side. And yeah, no real surprises as of yet. I don't think the, the first ban phase is really given us too many yeah. surprises over MSI. Like Lucian, Gwen, Wukong, sometimes you see a, you know, another strong jungler alongside that, but right now everything going to form. The question is, will G2 look to try and prioritize something tanky for Broken Blade in the top lane? The Ornn obviously has yeah. been something he's looked towards. Usually we don't see that until the second phase of picks though. But that's the thing, I feel like when you're looking at G2, right, you can look across the board and go, hey look, team fighting is where we've been strongest when we're looking at like Kai'Sa and these kind of team fighting picks for Flakid, the Ornn in the top side, playing for that late game strength. That's where they beat T1 the last time these two teams faced off. But I want to see if T1 are actually going to try and match them in that regard, right? But actually <laughs> taking the Ornn off the board means that they're kind of aware that this is probably what G2 want to go for. And it was the Ornn ban that started G2's decline. In their first game when they lost to uh, PSG, it was Ornn that was banned away. Then RNG, Ornn was taken away. And now we see another Ornn being removed by T1. First pick up here for G2. Yankos looking towards that Graves. Yeah, I mean, this has been really good for G2 when he's got his hands on 100% win rate on the Graves thus far. And certainly his looks strong in his ability to try and control the early state of the map, have that pressure in towards the mid lane as well. And just opening up the opportunity to try and play through that strong mid jungle that G2 like. It does mean that the Ari is available for Faker, though he's played it twice so far at MSI. 100% win rate on that. Yet to die on the champion wow. as yeah. well. Uh, Faker's Ari, very well renowned around the world. Alongside that, Nautilus here locked in for Carrion. Yeah, I'm curious though what we're going to get for Caps here. He was kind of the one that started this uh, Zoe trend in the mid lane, and I feel like if you've got the Graves, you got the Zoe, you got a lot of long range uh, poke potential or even upright just kill potential there. Um, but we'll have to see what the plan is going to be for G2. I feel like taking something like your um, your mid and your top here is probably going to be your best option. Well, there is the mid lane LeBlanc for Caps. 
Titans. Very well known for it in the LEC. He hasn't had the best games on it in the last couple that he's played, but it gives you that incredibly strong mid-jungle 2v2. It, like, LeBlanc and Graves is a match made in heaven in terms of damage potential. Alongside that, Broken Blade's gonna lock in the Gangplank. Yeah, I mean, Gangplank has been incredibly strong over the course of MSI and just has that weak side. Top laner, because you know you're going to have to blind pick it here on G2 side. So hoping instead that maybe they can get some nice pickups, say, in the AD carry position where they can counterpick that. But we'll have to see what the game plan is going to be. And um, certainly, I think at the moment, you got that pick potential in the back line is sky high for G2 right now. And I agree with that. I'm just a little surprised. Oh. Wow, Gangplank into Rumble. Okay, I'm a little surprised if Broken Blade picks the Gangplank. He hasn't played it at all this year, even though it is very strong. And then the Rumble is an answer. Now, we have seen Rumble in the support role, but with Nautilus locked in, my expectations are this Rumble will be going top. Yeah, I imagine so as well. It's just, it's kind of curious to see that, right? Because you're looking at, okay, well, this is a composition that has a good amount of mobility with the Graves and the Blanc. You'll get a good matchup into the lane, but I mean, if you end up taking some of these more mobile AD carries, which are being banned away by T1 at the moment, you actually have the, the opportunity to kind of move around from this rumble, especially if you're looking at something like Kaisa for Flacken in that bot lane. So we'll see if T1 agree with your assessment there. As you say, get rid of the Zaya to negate her ability to get away from that equalizer. G2 will remove Callista. There's going to be lots of AD carries pinched here yeah. already. Of course, the Lucian ban and the Caitlyn ban from phase one. Yeah, so you're kind of looking at picks like the Ezreal maybe coming through, but um, I don't really want to see that blind. I know a lot of people backstage will be very angry if that is the case, but I certainly think taking something like the Kaisa or maybe even banning the Kaisa yourself here from G2 and maybe looking for an Ezreal pickup yourself could work out just to give you the mobility away from what uh, T1 have picked up at the moment. Tom Kench, another one of those protective supports that can keep your AD carry safe, or anyone safe from that Rumble Ultimate. Here, though, if you ban Kaiser as G2, Ezreal can just be picked by yeah. T1. Gumiushi can take that for himself. Ezreal yeah. hasn't really been the strongest AD carry this MSI, but a lot of that's because Kaiser is such a good pick into it. Yeah, exactly. And I think, okay, with the Vi actually banned away, I was curious to see, because if you go for the Ezreal, you still got the answer of the Kaisa and also the Tristana as well, mm -hmm. right? And still having that mobility was available for a G2, but we'll have to see exactly what the game plan is here for Guma Yushi. Um, I mean, they could also just go for the top pick here, right? Like leave that AD oh, carry counter jungle pick. pick. Oh, sorry, jungle pick, pick yeah. yeah. Um, and go for the, the counter pick on the AD carry instead, which could work out super well. That looks to be what they're going to do. Viego gives you an AD threat in the jungle, which uh, with the Vi band and the Lee band is kind of really the only one left alongside that Wukong that's been removed. So having AD alongside those two AP top side of the map makes a lot of sense for T1. The only thing I'm worried about here for T1 is though you have very little engage and you're kind of relying on the skill shots from Faker or like a big hook coming through from the Nautilus. You're not getting that upfront kind of like an Alistair or a Leona or some of that that can start you off. So I think looking at this, you're probably going to uh, look more for those pick opportunities using the long range of the Rumble Ult, follow up with the the Ari and see if you can catch G2 out the rotation. Yeah, get that slow and then see if you can follow up on that. Jin here for Flackard. No mobility in his kit itself, but his range does allow him to stay back at the start of team fights. You can just pop that, pop that ultimate to try and influence a fight. Alongside that, it looks like Targamus is going to opt for his Rakan. Yeah, and I think it's a good shout, right? So, I mean, you've got Jin, who's relatively safe in the bottom side of the map, so should be able to open up Targamus to look for some of these early roams, mm -hmm. particularly played through caps, and that has kind of been the, the story of G2 thus far in MSI, and where we look across Guma Yushi. Honestly, I feel like going towards um, something like the, the Kaisa could work out here, even if you wanted to go towards uh, the, the Jinx or the Aphelios. It's like Aphelios has got nerfed indirectly through the Gale Force nerfs, going from 90 seconds to 60 seconds, I'm sorry, 60 seconds to 90 seconds, but I mean, you can still play very strongly through this AD carry, and it looks like that's going to be the game plan here for T1. I mean, Gumi's also played it 11 times this year and won 10 of those games. Yeah, it's not like, a bad stat, is it? He's pretty good at this AD carry. We'll see if he can bring it out and have a good performance here against G2. Obviously, T1 trying to battle back from that 0-1 in the head-to-head -head so far, trying to battle back as well from a loss to EG earlier today. Yeah, and I think one of the cool things about Aphelios as well is that he can, in some certain situations, act as another engage tool, right? You get that in, uh, that ult with the Moonlight Vigil, you get the Gravitum, and that can be a way of trying to set things up. My biggest worry, though, for T1 is if Caps gets rolling early, there's very little things that can actually, like, hold him in place, right? There's just the Nautilus ult, realistically, that Caps has to try and worry about, so it could open up this LeBlanc to really pop off if G2 can get the mid lane rolling. We'll see if G2 are able to get that jungle mid ahead. Caps has been 
Strong in lane, but nullified in the last few games. Teams have spent a lot of time making sure that he doesn't get rolling. Even in the RNG game, he was out laning Xiaohu, but you saw Wei was always there to try and make plays. And Kerry are very well known for his roaming up towards the mid lane as well. Nautilus gives you that potential. Aphelios can be left alone down towards that bottom side. Yeah, and I think that's going to be the big game plan here from both sides, right? Is trying to wrestle control over this mid lane, get the supports involved, and then you can actually start to work around the map as well. Because obviously quite a volatile matchup in the mid lane between the LeBlanc and the Ari. So whoever gets that lead suddenly gets to take control of side lanes as well. From undefeated to very beatable in the last few days. G2 and T1 trying to make a rise back up the standings. Only one of them can claim the win here today. Of course, both teams still have two more matches after this one. Both teams still have another day to try and rectify their woes. But a win here is a big signal to the rest of the MSI teams that you are not to be trifled with. Yeah, I feel like, though, whoever gets control of this early stages is just going to be able to blow up in this game. Like, you don't grab particularly tanky members on either side. You've got a ton of assassination potential, like resets galore uh, coming in on T1. It definitely feels like, looking at this, that if T1 can get these early leads, they have the potential to look for those fights and take the game off of G2 here. And T1, obviously, very good at getting early leads in the else again, even here at MSI. Like, the last time they played against G2, they were 5,000 gold ahead yeah. at the 15 minute mark and G2 were able to fight back with that Diana Yasuo comp. But yeah. I wonder if, uh, if G2's early game struggles will continue in this game and if T1 will be able to jump and pounce and get that early lead. You can see at the moment, though, they're already trying to set up for a vision control, right? Make sure they're able to spot out exactly where our owner is and give as much information as possible across. Cap's now just making sure that he keeps tabs on Faker as they go and actually look for the red buff steel here. So trying to look for a split map. Zayas came down from the top lane as well, puts the ward down. Broken Blade will meet with Zayas. Flame Spitter goes down. Broken Blade looking for that trial by fire passive, but just a single parlay won't mean they both trade about equally on health. Owner could look for a red steel, and we might actually end up with a split map here, Dagdor. Yeah, and I don't think it particularly favors, like, either side particularly much, to be honest. I think the big one is just trying to, like, remove Zayas from being able to punish as heavily on this rumble, like, trying to make sure that the GP can actually get up towards those later stages. But you still have to be careful around this bot side, right? Like, it's not like giving an Aphelios an easy lane is going to help you later on as well. So definitely trying to give power to Broken Blade early and hoping they can still deal with Guma Yushi later on. Yankos has been pretty forthright with his early ganks in this... MSI usually goes towards the mid lane, of course, but Zeus here is pushed up the wave. Not in the best of shapes for him. I wonder if Jankos will look for something. No ward for Zeus. Used it earlier on. Broken Blade on the chase here. Zeus going to get pinged by that barrel, and Jankos is on the way. Red buff slows. Zeus tries to flash in the midst of the minions. The end of the line, not enough. Zeus burns his flash and has no TP to get back to land. And that's the big one, right? No TP available for Zeus because he took the ignite, which means now he's got to do, well, it's going to say the slow walk back, but he's actually going to stick around, which may prompt Jankos to go for something on this top side, but Owner is hovering on this bot side with a big wave about to crash as well. Of course, Zeus running the ignite flash here on the rumble in the top lane does mean that you can be caught out by these early ganks. You want to stay around to try and get the extra wave as it pushes in, but then sometimes you're repeat ganked. As you say, Dagda. And I think this is where it gets really interesting for Broken Blade, just build-wise, right? Because you can always go towards the... the um, why have I forgotten the Trinity name? Force, Hole Breaker. Hole Breaker. Yeah. yes, thank you. And go straight for like, hey, I'm just going to play side lanes, right? Because you've got the ult to make sure that you're actually always going to be present in these fights. You've got the TP advantage as well. Zayas can't really push the wave back. So I think for Broken Blade, like in this later portion of the game, he should have full control of side lanes and make it really difficult for T1 to actually group up and try and look for these picks. I love games like this because although it sometimes looks like not a huge amount is happening, you have to think of the ramifications of each individual play. With a split map specifically, what you're looking at is how far ahead... Oh, as the charm does land. Cap should be able to walk away from this one. What we're looking at for G2 is how far ahead can Broken Blade get. And what we're looking at for T1 is how far ahead can Gumiyushi and Kerry get because they've split the map down the middle. Ona will spend more time on the bottom side, Yankos will spend more time on the top side, and both the junglers are just willing to give up the opposite side of the map. Yeah, and that's why I was kind of looking to see what the story was going to be with Faker, right? Because yeah. Faker does have control over the mid lane. I was looking to see if when we got this fourth wave crash on bot side, if Faker was going to roam down. Because again, I think the, the actual thing that's going to break open this game is those mid lane roams. Because as you can see, Zayas already set pretty far behind. He still hasn't reset, which is why we're getting All broken lane able to bully him out. Ona is here. Yankos dashes in. Zayas will fall for first blood. Ignite is sticking on broken blade. Ona could look for the flash. 
Flash Spectral Mort is enough. The oranges make Broken Blade K. He flashes away himself. Broken Blade trying to dodge around. Ono with the Blade of the Ruined King. That Q a possibility, but it's not enough as the parlay connects once again. Ona playing Ring Around the Rosies a little bit. It's true. Alcove Gaming in the top lane. Spectral Mort coming out. Broken Blade will still be stunned by it. Ona not quite enough damage to get a counter kill. A great play from Yankos there. Hiding in the alcove. Pops over the wall. T1 of absolutely no idea. He's up there and just unfortunate for Owner trying to help out Zayas. Trying to get him that uh, shadow so he could reset. But it ends up giving two kills across the G2. And for T1 and for Zayas in particular, that was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> We're going into a replay, hoping that that would do that one afterwards. It's a great joke, but as you say, just using the Fog of War here, Jankos manages to sneak into this push. Yeah, really well played here. And as you can see, T1 with Zayas not having his flash available, which just goes down instantly. Owner tries everything, but just getting the oranges there in time for Broken Blade. And now Owner can't actually follow up. He has no flash. And Broken Blade just playing just at arm's length, so he can't fall as well. Charm's going to land here onto Caps. Hogmas is here, but a good hook. We mean the Caps is locked up. He's going to try and dodge across the wall. Flacken here to join the fray. Once again, Targamus in the right position to counter this out. He now flashes forward. They're looking for the damage onto Ono, who has no flash of his own. The chains will connect. Flacken not able to get close enough for that final auto. And Ona escapes underneath his tower once again. Really nice job from both the bot laners of G2, though. Moving up, keeping the mid lane safe, and making sure that Caps doesn't end up falling there. And that's something you can do a lot with Jin, is just make sure that you're there with the Deadly Flourish to follow up on a bunch of this CC. And it's not like he's going to lose out on too much bot, right? Gamely usually pushes the wave right as Flacka gets down here. Look at where Zeus is once again. Yankos is behind him. There is a ward that's going to oh, spot him no. out. But Zeus, you got no flash, you got no level six. And the bushes might protect you for a moment, but the chase is on. Broken Blade doesn't get the barrel combo. Perhaps not having played GP this year, not playing out too well for him. But Yankos comes in. Zeus hits six equalizer to try and clear out the wave. Meanwhile, in the mid lane, Caps forced away by Faker and Carrier. The chains come in. Faker uses the last spirit rush to escape. Deadly flourish in the bottom lane. Targamus with the chase. The knock up. Gumi Yushi pops the heal and flashes over the wall. Caps now has to try and get away from Ona off towards the top side of the map. Has he got the distortion? Spectral Moor gets the stun. Caps locked up. Flashes and dashes up towards Broken Blade and Owner and Carrier still on the chase here. Guma burnt both his summoners in the bot lane, is still underneath the tower. Yankos coming up as well, they're gonna try and turn it around. Cannon Barrage just short, doesn't get the slow onto Owner. Carrier here will be able to hook himself back to the wall, should be underneath the tower, should be safe, but Yankos with the collateral damage misses. Blackhead kills Guma Yushi down towards the bottom side. No summoners on the T1 bot laner. He over pushes and he gets dived under his tower. What is going on in this game? It's just a bloodbath across the board. Caps is running one way, People are dying topside, <laughs> bot lane is going down. I mean, this is fantastic. This is so much fun. This is real League of Legends this right here. That, that, <laughs> <laughs> none of that messing about. But meanwhile, Faker was able to take a, a plate in the mid lane. G2, four kills to the good. 1,600 gold ahead in this early game. Yeah, and look, we're just going to get a replay on this bottom side as well. Guma here, stuck underneath the terror. No hope because they know exactly where Kerry is in top side. Just a nice, easy, quick pick. Just understanding, hey, look, he's going to be left by himself. And now you pick up your own plate on the bottom side as well. And the thing for Guma there is he hits six, right? So he's like, oh, I can Moonlight Vigil, grab it and stun. But assuming the Rakan tanks the tower first, he can always just dash back out to flack it. So well played yeah. by G2 to make sure no one was tanking the tower for too long. And I think the, the thing here now is G2 starts to move up towards Zayas. Might have to hold on to my point. He's got flash, he's got a blast cone. It's going to be locked up. There's the equalizer going down. Zayas looking for the flash onto Broken Blade. No, he can only get a one for one in this case. Will pay for it with his life, but a one for one for T1 puts them on the board. Nice job from Zayas there to actually make that a one for one trade. With the mental resource that are invested up there, it could have gone so much worse. Does mean that Rift Arrow will go across to G2, but Gumiyushi, red and white, going to take down a lot of these turret plates and bot side. And honestly, just answer back for what that Rift Arrow should get in a few moments' time. So realistically, T1 evening up that trade. And once again, we have to look of the differences in the top lane and in the bot lane. Gumi Yushi's gonna get five plates. There might be a fight happening in the mid lane in a second, but 300, 500 gold ahead after he takes yeah. his tower up towards the top side. Broken Blade is about the same ahead of Zeus. And that's why I want you to look at that gold on the bottom of your screen, right? Because you're looking at Gumi Yushi, absolutely huge. Yankos, massive. And you're looking as well at Broken Blade, who has that advantage. And especially when you get the Umbro Glaive this early, you get to start to clear out vision, you start to stack up the... Uh... Oh, I'm actually gonna hold on to this T1. No, you can hold it. Away. Grasp it but gently. <laughs> Hold, it. Yeah, yeah. Hold it. Hold <laughs> it. No, nothing's going to happen. Um, 
But yeah, you get to stack up the Ghost Ward as well, super, super mm -hmm. quick. So you end up getting a bunch of that early adaptive damage as well, and you suddenly become a monster. So I'm definitely looking at Yankos to see how much work he can do. But honestly, I think T1 at the moment, like, especially with the position that they were in, for them to be able to make these trades, even up the gold, get that dragon for themselves as well, they're doing a good job of fighting back against this early aggression of G2. Yeah, something T1 uh, are very good at. Just, uh, I want to come back to that Zombie Ward point, because I don't know if we uh, always explain it. Zombie Ward, basically, when you take down a ward, you gain bonus attack damage or ability power up to 10 wards taken down. So you can get 12 extra AD, or I think it's 20 extra AP out of it. And that's how having the Umbral Glaive early when you're running Zombie Ward means that you just stack that up so much quicker. Yeah, and exactly. And that extra AD obviously going to be more impactful the earlier you can get exactly. it as well. So it's just a nice little trade. And why Graves is kind of risen up in the meta alongside the uh, the Umbral Glaive changes. So. Surprise! <laughs> Got him! Got him! Don't forget to grab your exclusive Scare Prize gaming emote as you strut when you flash in and turn a fight. <laughs> I, had to, I had to get it out. Your yeah, point was great. Yeah, I thought you were getting yeah, to the yeah, end yeah, of it yeah. as well, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, zombie war, sorry, zombie wars and ghost wars and all this kind of stuff. I mean, exactly. it's a good time, you know, Halloween all around, but Faker's not having the best of times as Yanko starts to show up again. Targamas. Should be all right. It should be okay. And T1 have managed to close the gold gap that we started to see developing by G2. It's now only 200 gold between the two teams. Guma Yushi almost at 100 CS, almost at, you know, nine and a half, ten a minute. And he's going to be very fed on this Ophelia. So already got the first mythic of the game with this Gale Force. And this is where I've got to try and figure out how T1 can include Guma in a lot of their fights. Because, yes, he is absolutely massive. But, you know, Caps should be playing just very quick in and out. Flacket playing at range. You've got the Broken Blade Ultimate that's going to cause Guma Yushi issues as well. Sure. It starts to become a little bit more difficult for him to get these fights so you're heavily reliant on these good ultimates from Zayas Faker and both the uh, the skill shots and carry at landing to enable Guma in these fights so he's not just kind of kept out of pace. We'll keep our eyes on the T180 carry came into the tournament it's part of the best bot lane in the world carry has seen pro probably is the best player in the world yeah. coming into MSI and Guma Yushi alongside him is very strong. He's yet to live up to that potential in my eyes on the MSI stage. I think Gala has generally just been the best AD carry at MSI. And we'll see <laughs> Take if... Take uh... the last game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ignore one game, you know. That's the thing with MSI, right? As the Rift Hole comes down in the top lane, this will get plates. Uh, I don't know if Flackett attacked the tower recently. Oh, Hook's gonna land. Flackett did get two of those plates. And so, yeah, he gets some gold out of it as well. Uh, but yeah, I... That's something about MSI that I, I always love watching and seeing, and I'm part of it, and we're all part of it as casters. Best of one over reactions is just the most fun thing in the world. Because <laughs> everyone's like, G2 are the best team in the world, as they look for perhaps something in the top lane, then they lose a couple of games, and then they're not the best team in the world anymore. When Carrier here, Ona coming in for the chase as well. Depth Judge onto Flackhead. He does not have the flash and the cleanse. Charm going out, Ona going in with the stun as well, but Targamus should just be able to dodge back here. The Equalizer, though, perfectly placed alongside the Infernum. T1 pounce in the top lane. Caps is coming up, though. They're looking for a chase of their own. I don't know if Yankos is there, because they can't see the minimap, but I'm sure T1 are waiting. Collateral damage going in. Caps hooked. Great hook from Carrier. Yankos takes one. Caps dives in. Caps goes down. It's a superb fight for T1 in the top lane. G2 overextend, and T1 clap them down. T1 are doing such a good job of fighting back in this game. They start off with the deficit, but they get the picks top. Now another play top. They're getting so many turret plates onto Guma Yushi. Now you're starting to trade kills as well. This is phenomenal from T1. And you'll see it here, right? You've already got Zayas moving up river, which is why T1 are good to go for this. They know Broken Blade has the ult, but with just two members here and Zayas here, or, sorry, two members from G2 and a fourth from T1 arriving, they know they can just take these down super easily. And you just don't have the advantage here. 2v4, yes, you'll get one back, but the help bar is just that little bit too high that for hook, G2 man. to be able to take them down. The carrier hook stops Caps from getting the double bounce in the heel coming out as well. And now the game really changes in favor of T1. Carrier with a hex flash into the hook. Targum is going to dash away to Caps. Faker going in with the charm. Targumus tanks it instead of Caps. And Faker gets his first kill of the game. And now T1 starting to pull ahead in this game. They're getting control of River. They're getting control of these kills. And with 50 seconds until the dragon as well, they should be able to get bot side River control and set up for this dragon. And you said it, Dagda. You said, can T1 involve Gumi Yushi? He is strong. Can they use his strength against G2? They have done exactly that. Four kills, well, two kills, two assists for him in the top lane. Now they're moving Kerry around the map. Now they're opening up the map. And it means these picks, these catches, where you don't need hard engage, are so much easier for T1. Guma Yushi is terrifying. Yeah, he's a monster. This man is about to back, probably pick up his second item. And you're looking across a flat kick going, hey, bud. Um, 
How's that uh, Gale Force treating you right now? Because my word, T1 are popping off. And again, you've already got first dragon for T1. They're going to be able to look for a second. And especially when you hit this mid game with like an Ari, the Rumble, Guma as well as fed as he is, T1 are looking very strong for these team fights. Guma has 7,300 gold. That's 500 gold a minute on this AD <laughs> carry. The guy is an absolute beast. And right now, T1 are playing around him perfectly. TP's coming in from T1 as Faker comes down to towards that bottom side. G2 currently have control over the river. Guma step forward. Yankos looking for something here. Black it doesn't land. The captive audience. Faker still not there. Caps off towards the side. Zona try to step forward. Still vision control in favor of G2. Remember that Umbral Glaive will help them out so much in situations like this. Even if it's already popped the passive, Yankos can still just auto a ward and kill it unless it's a control ward. G2 with control over the river. Faker. Oh, he's gonna step. Oh, the chain misses. Faker has the time to spirit rush to the side. The rest of T1 collapsing from the top side. Caps still on the chase here. Spirit rush across the wall of possibility. Owner here to shepherd Faker back towards that dragon. That's such a big ultimate from Faker gone. So if T1 try and contest, Faker can't provide that engage to who we were talking about. G2 gonna see if they can fight back here. Caps looking for a flank. Owner going in. Spectral more lands the stun. Hook just short. Caps still has a good flank position. Can of rush. Argumus looking for the quickness. Caps there. Owner dodges the spectral more coming out, the equalizer down, and Targumus will burn, burn, burn! So will Yankos! Count starts onto the back line, but he's only able to take out Kevin, and then he goes down as well! G2 got the dragon, overforced the fight, and T1 shut them down! T1 ended up missing a ton of their engage tools, which is why G2 thought they could take the fight, but you end up having Targumus ulted immediately by Kara. Phenomenal call from the T1 support! So T1 take the fight, they take the terror, and they'll get a good amount of gold off that play. And you see the gold swing, 3,000 in T1's favor now. They continue to accelerate this game, and even though G2 thought they made it, made a catch, it was T1 who were waiting in the darkness, ready to jump in. And this is the thing with T1, like Azeo said it, they're a sleeping beast, the LCK yeah. often, T1 especially, so whenever they come to an international tournament, you have to be wary. And I wonder, perhaps, if the last couple of results have woken T1 up from their hibernation. Yeah, watch here though. So we already talked about Faker not having the engage. The hook goes wide from Carry, and G2 are like two engage tools down. Let's go. Targamus though gets hit by the depth charge. He can't follow up. Caps has been dealt with on the side before G2 can get the engage, and Broken Blade looks like he's dead. Nowhere for Broken Blade to go here. T1, the triumvirate of death collapses. Broken Blade will try and claim out a minion, but Owner will clear his HP. T1 with another kill. They've got Riptail down towards this bottom side as well, and they are pinging that tier two. Yeah, Broken Blade just too far up. You don't have pressure in any of the other lanes, and T1 able to collapse beautifully, and as you say, tier two potentially available for them. Gumi Yushi and Kerry are starting to step tentatively forward to see if they can get this tier two in the mid lane as well. Of course, a huge win for T1 if they can claim this. Five and three separates them from that chasing pack. Also means the head-to-head -head with G2 is equalized, so if they match up, on win loss at the end of tomorrow, we would have to play a tiebreaker. G2, massive loss. 2 0 two days in a row would be devastating for this European lineup, especially since how well day one and day two went for them. Riptail charging in here. Tier two taken by T1. They continue their advance towards the base. Council take a tier one in response. And that will be that. T1 retreats to the safety of what used to be Jisoo's jungle, but is now owned by the LCK representatives. Yeah, and T1 have been doing such a good job of just playing out on the map. Caps trying to get something back to the top side, but with that Rip Tails, T1 get a huge amount. Now you're looking at a 3,000 gold lead. Collector completed for Gumi Yushin. He's still just about to reset too. So I feel like when you look towards two and a half minutes, this next dragon, I don't think G2 can really contest for it. I think you got to go and try and play side lanes, try and see if you can get some of that much needed gold back in your pocket and avoid T1 as you hit that spike. The good thing for G2 is they already took a mountain a second of the game, even though they lost the fight after it, making sure that T1 aren't stacking up towards a Hextech Soul, because by darn it, Hextech yeah. Soul with a Nathaniel's and a Rumble and a V8. Like, no, no, you do not want to play into that. In my opinion, the strongest soul in the game, true damage tick and a slow and chains on the autos is just absolutely deadly. However, Faker yeah, might be in a deadly situation. Spirit rushes away from the deadly flourish. Caps still on the chase, but two Spirit Rush charms left for Faker means that he should just be able to dash his way out of this one. Charm, though, into the equalizer. Caps gonna jump across the wall here. Faker still on the chase. Hook just short. Owner here with a flank position. Caps is now isolated from the rest of G2. Targum is stunned. Carrier. Dredge line, a possibility. 
But with the equalizer down, I think T1 are just buying time for Gumayushi to continue to push in this top lane. Yeah, it's a split map though. You got Broken Blade on bot side, T1 going in to try and help Guma on the other end. So again, I like this from G2. When you're behind like this, trying to trade even across the map is going to be great, but you do have to make sure you get this terror reset and you're not going to lose an inhibitor turret. Faker with another great charm into the Evercross. The chase is on. Faker flashes away. Caps under the tower. Hook lands. T1. They don't want you to be able to play on the other side of the map instead. They look for the plays themselves. Caps get the shot down onto Faker. Inhibitor tower falls in the top lane. Zayus Ze Ze underneath this tower. Forced away by Broken Blade, but there's no minion wave. The inhibitor will go down. T1 will take that in the top lane. Will they keep pushing? I doubt it. Instead, they take the Hextech gates out and find their way to safety. That's an inhibitor down on the top side of the map, though. And uh, you've got 45 seconds until this next dragon. It becomes so much harder for G2 to make that play we are just talking about, where you can try and cross map for a tier 2 in the top lane because you're up against the super minions. T1 played that immaculately. The willingness just to say, okay, 3v3, we go in. We fight this. T1 new. If Faker dies, that's fine. We don't even lose the tower out of it. There was shut down, I believe, going over his caps. He's now got himself a Blightning Jewel, but that LeBlanc is not looking too scary yet. Only the Ludens Blightning Jewel. Only an item and a half on Flakkard as well, whereas Gumiyushi almost at three completed items. That Infinity Edge is going to hurt. And this is where you're going to have to see if T1 can once more set up for this fight. Faker and carry it. Two eyes on them to get onto the core members of G2. Yanko's starting up the Dragon. Zayas has the Equalizer. Carrier doesn't have the Depth Charge. There's the Equalizer down. It's only going to help G2 for the moment. Carrier going in. Broken Blade looking to flash out. Caps can dash as well. G2 get the Dragon and get out. Yeah, and just the fact that Owner got his back reset, or start, had to restart it, meant that he couldn't get the reset he wanted in time to get out towards Dragon. So G2 finding that very brief window where they're actually able to get out. So at least for the moment, keeping these Dragons within touching distance and buying time for this Gangplank to come online, for them to hit that later point where maybe they can try and fight back against T1. Uh, can you just check your watch for me there, Dagda? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's about 20 minutes. It's Baron o'clock for T1. <laughs> They, uh, they oh god. Just this lost the fight. Gumi Yushi going forward, perhaps baiting in Kerry with the flash across the wall. An oh incredible engage! T1, take G2, lift them up, and break their spines over their knee! T1 are breaking G2 like it's absolutely nothing! They baited Baron, knowing that everyone thinks they do that. Baron o'clock, but it turns out it's time to end the game, Medic. 21 minutes for T1. It feels like a record for the Rumble Sage. Cavs trying to do what he can, but once again, he's charmed up. And he has been anything but claps today. T1 unwilling to go quietly into the night. You woke the beast, and the beast is angry. T1 will destroy G2, dismantle them, and European fans can only watch in despair as the LCK rises again. The LCK will not be denied going to five and three, pushing up into that second place. And that was domination from T1. Early game was definitely in favor of G2, but T1 able to fight back so well to take this victory. Beautiful stuff from them. They baited me, they baited G2 with the Baron play. Carrier as well. Hex flash over the wall, I into know. the hook. Guma with the follow-up. And we wondered in the early game, would Guma be strong enough? Would T1 be able to play around this better Felios? They did exactly that. Yeah, it was absolutely spectacular. I mean, team fights were wonderful. Their dragon control was great. And the Baron bait as well just draws G2 in to one of the quickest games we've had at MSI thus far. A shellacking to be sure. G2, of course, well, just a sad day for them. 0-2, 0-2 over the last four games. It has been a struggle. Their winning ways have turned very much into defeat. And now they have one day really to rectify their fortunes because it's very possible at the moment. G2 are looking at either fourth or even fifth place. Yeah, and I mean, look, you're up against Saigon Buffalo tomorrow against Evil Geniuses as well. So, I mean, at least you hopefully think that's a bit more of a confident play, but I'm going to beat Froggy. T1 today. I was going to say, with EG beating T1, Froggy popping off yep. against RNG, that's no longer a definite. I actually don't know what's going to happen here. We'll have to wait and see for tomorrow. Of course, we still have two more games left today, and they're going to be bangers. PSU versus Saigon Buffalo up next. Like, just the way these two, everyone has leveled up. Like, everyone apart from yeah. the teams that were really good at the start has really <laughs> leveled up, and it's great to watch MSI today. It's been such a fun experience. And I think with Saigon Buffalo versus PSG, my question is, which team is able to carry the form they had earlier today into that game? Yeah, I mean, Atlas said it backstage. It's like, unironically, the best two mid laners that we've had today yep. fighting off against each other. So I'm very excited to see what way that one goes. So am I. Before we head to the break, 
catch PSG's pick, the Pokemon theme song, as the song that represents their playstyle and the rest of the teams competing at MSI on the official MSI 2022 playlist on Spotify. Banger. <laughs> Red Bull gives you wings. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really getting to a day and night. I'm really in a game, I live that life. Fake them left and then I take them right. I ain't going out without a fight. I put on a show under the lights. Love it when they say my name on the mic. I like play, make them wanna show it twice. I like play, make them wanna show it twice. I'm the coldest, get it done in freezing rain. When I get in my zone, I can feel it in my veins. I go tunnel vision, ain't nobody that can stop me. I'm legendary, they just want the jersey on my body. Put up the numbers, people trying to say they love me. Work out every summer, cause the winter gon' get ugly. Feel like the world against me, got me going even harder. Take off like a rocket, I'ma snap it like I'm hot. When I go beast, how you gonna stop it? When I see the blitz, I just call an option. I'ma take my time, never leave the pocket. Man, it's not nice, so don't even try it. When I go beast, how you gonna stop it? When I see the blitz, I just call an option. I'ma take my time, never leave the pocket. Man, it's not nice, so don't even try it. I'm really getting to a day and night. I'm really in the game, I live that life. Fake them left and then I take them right. I ain't going out without a fight. I put on a show under the lights. Love it when they say my name on the mic. I like play, make them wanna show it twice. I like play, make them wanna show it twice. Ball don't lie, do it die, it's my time. Fourth inches, put it all on the line. I'm a big boss, yeah, I do it out of sight. I really run this, you just running out of time. I'm pushing a rock when I dish it, it's a dime. But it's a decline, but I'm still in my prime. All this hard work, only right that I shine. All I know is grind, put it over over time. When I go beast, how you gonna stop it? When I see the blitz, I just call an option. I'ma take my time, never leave the pocket. Man, it's not nice, so don't even try it. When I go beast, how you gonna stop it? When I see the blitz, I just call an option. I'ma take my time, never leave the pocket. Man, it's not nice, so don't even try it. I'm really getting to a day and night. I'm really in the game, I live that life. Fake them left and then I take them right. I ain't going out without a fight. I put on a show under the lights. Love it when they say my name on the mic. I like play, make them wanna show it twice. I like play, make them wanna show it twice. Hey. State Farm Analyst Desk after T1 and 1 successfully take revenge on G 0 and 2 times 2 after now they've dropped another game. Um, unfortunately, Emily was struggling to keep her feet on the floor, so we've all decided to cross our legs for this one. Yeah. Have a little bit sure. of fun with it. 
Um, that game ended so dramatically quickly, and there was a lot of discussion around the draft, the approach to game. Um, I do want to talk about some of the the uh, elements that happened later on, but let's start off with the draft. Emily, when we started, what did you make of the picks and bans? I made a joke saying that the uh, demise of Jinx and Aphelios have been grossly overrated because it <laughs> seemed to work pretty well, this game. Uh, so I liked them going back to something like the Aphelios, obviously, Kuma got a ton of early plates based on the way that they, A, rotated him around the map, but also the way it started off as a split map and the two teams' separate focuses. Um, I think I really like this for, for T1 because, as you saw, again, they could still play out in these mid-game fights so well. Um, and, yeah, I mean they're not as, you know, they're not as, like, strong and, like, super lane dominant, like, contesting the 2v2, like we saw um, T1 play Caitlyn Lux. But I still think we saw how they want to play around their AD carry, right? Like, not only in team fights, but you push that first turret down, you get the plate gold, you rotate him up topside, chew through that turret. Like, this is a lot... It's a nice marriage, right, of, of right. the draft, okay. a, a better draft and what I saw from T1 domestically in their success. And ultimately, I feel like when you have him on the Aphelios in this situation, you get him ahead. Because he's always ahead of the curve, the Jin, he's always going to be more valuable. They knew they could rely on him in the team fights. And even the fact that Zeus was targeted so heavily on the top side, mm -hmm. but he kept, like, trading his life for waves and really neutralized the pressure Folks, they had. I'm so glad you bring that up because I want to talk about Yankos' early game kills. He was on the <laughs> graves. He passed top. And always when we're looking at these clips, tell me about what was happening. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of these situations, when you're playing Rumble, you have to play aggressive in the lane. So the map's it did make it rough, but we saw so many situations where he'd die to trade for the wave. I do think that owner ended up overstepping here, and this is where things did look a little bit rough because you're finding the momentum. But ultimately, I think owner sort of respected that you kind of just had to let Zayas do his thing and play towards the player he wanted to get ahead. And then situations like this, you know, he has been targeted, he's been uh, taken out of the game, but he does manage to actually hit level six here, I believe, and clear out the wave before he goes down. Yeah, and this is actually really important because it still means... Yeah, right there, the equalizer goes down. Um, it still means that he's clearing it out, so the CS difference isn't yeah. that high. And when it came to the mid-game teamfights, his equalizers and focus were... Amazing. I mean, they were fantastic. Just before we get to some more of those clips, um, we wanted to take a look at the difference between uh, the golden experience between Broken Blade and Kumayushi because of the priorities and the focus, right, in terms of who was either getting support and who was being shut down. And just as we take a look at those numbers, so Broken Blade plus 640 gold, um, minus 60. I can't actually quite read that. I don't know if you can over there, Emily. Thank you. Uh, six. 640, there 677. We, we actually haven't seen then, the numbers because, yeah. again, the game ended so quickly. Does this match the theory you were thinking about okay. in terms of that, like, split map, in terms of how the teams are prioritizing their uh, uh, you know, yeah, players? Yeah, sorry. My, uh, even with glasses, my eyesight is terrible. I'm pretty sure that says, though, 2.1K yep. gold difference uh, for, for yeah, Kuma yeah. at uh, mm -hmm. 14. So, I mean, yep. that is the big thing, right? Like, once again, when we're talking about what T1 were so good at domestically, it was understanding how to get through those turrets and push them down quickly with Kuma. And again, we saw that with the Aphelios pick, I think they played around it really well. And to Dan's point with the Rumble, he still ended up clearing out the wave. I want to move us on really quickly to the next replay as we are going to move on to this 12-minute team fight. This is the point where I started to go, right, game over, G2's done. I mean, <laughs> just top lane chaos. Um, ebbs, absolutely everybody got involved. But it, it dragged out and ultimately T1 come out on top. Yeah, and I mean, T1, I think something is that they've always been keen on skill check and we've highlighted a lot of times this tournament, but this composition really gives them the tools to do so when it comes to those fights. And I, I just feel like they're connecting with the skills they need to, they're really delivering, they have good target priority when it comes down to executing here. Yeah, and the big thing to me that we kind of said going into this match, this is why, even though I predicted T1, I was like, I kind of want to see the draft going in, uh, is it's not that they can't team fight, right? Like, they team fight really well together. It's more that sometimes their drafts versus what the enemy composition was weren't allowing them to come out ahead anyway, and sometimes the synchronization it, was off. We didn't see that in this Even game. when your prediction is correct, you still have lukewarm taste. <laughs> I, mean, I come know. On. I am like, just seriously. the most boring person. I do I want to move us on and talk a little bit more about Zeus in particular because he does pick up the OP player of the game. As a quick stat, that was the first rumble of the rumble stage and it oh is now undefeated. Lord. 
for Zeus at MSI Rumble stage. Orgs, you've been singing Zeus's praises, and uh, we got some more highlights. Yeah, I mean, a lot of games when he's gotten ahead, we've seen some fantastic play from him. But this was a game where he was set behind, but he made these smart tactical decisions. And then when it came to those team fights, which you've highlighted being so important in this meta, just being able to connect so consistently with these big ultimates. And that's the thing on Rumble. The ultimate is such a critical tool, which can often, oh. you know, be perfectly placed like this. But then you've also seen plenty of plays where players completely misalign them, so it can make all the difference. And this fight, this We're gonna is see super it again. important. We're going to see it again. All right, so I'm not allowed to talk about no, it? No, I, I want you to set up a little bit more, because right. 21 minutes into the game, um, T1 fall back to Baron. They yes. legitimately bait. And there was a joke that I saw, I think, on Reddit or Twitter that said, every Baron bait throw was leading up to this Baron bait fight. And I think we will have the separate in just a moment. Okay, yeah. So backstage, uh, we actually were sitting with Cogler and Atlas, and they were just like, they're learning. <laughs> they're <laughs> learning. Um, because this is definitely more what you want to see from T1, right? Like controlling that space around the Baron, not leaving it up for chance, having a really good, again, I still think T1 is one of the best teams at playing around Fog of War, and you saw them doing that here um, against G2, because G2 oh. kind of has no, I know Trevor, I'm sorry. It hurts um, so G2, much. G2 has no choice, kind of, but to go into this, and then just going in against the Rumble, like, it just, it feels terrible. And I think critically, they have great tools to turn around in this yep. situation, but also making the decision to do so, instead of letting G2 approach and just taking a fight in the pit, which could be a real flip in that situation. So huge credit for T1. And again, my, my kind of thought process was like, G2 approaching that, we're like, oh, T1's in Baron pit. They'll probably just be staying in the pit <laughs> and trying to take it down I, as quick as possible. I was sitting smugly saying to Atlas, oh yeah, we're behind in gold in 14 minutes. We've got a team fighting comp. This is great for us, right? And then they literally just face check the rumble and everything. Oh man, G2 just got smashed that game. At least that fight rather. <laughs> just this game? That you know, four in a row at this point? G2, as you owe and two twice in a row. That's four games down. They're four and four. That five and five uh, setup could end up being the case. Right, now we do need to turn our attention to the next match at hand.